I'd just like to welcome everyone to the ABMC Research Mini Reviews. And um, today's um, title is Samri on Neurobiology. And we have two terrific speakers in Tim Sargent and Stuart Really, Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on Ghana land and pay our respects to the elders past and present and acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders who are on the call today. So we're going to start with Tim Sargent, who's going to be talking to us about dysfunctional cell recycling in the lysosomal system, a modifiable target for delaying dementias. Sounds very exciting, Tim, and um, off you go. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, um, so it's, it's great to be here to talk. Um, the photograph on the screen right now is lysosomal health and aging. Um, this is a photograph taken at Christmas time when we're all out painting. Um, the purpose of my group is to delay the onset of dementia using the lysosomal system. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll kind of understand the, the direction we're taking with regards to research. Scientists have been, scientists and clinicians, so I've been really successful in developing um, interventions and, and management um, plans for management for dealing with single diseases at a time or single symptoms from single diseases. Um, for example, statins reduce the risk of heart attacks. Uh, diabetes can be managed with metformin, um, and this has been great. Uh, however, um, it's not unusual to have multiple age-related disease in a single person at a single time. For example, diabetes increases the risk of dementia um, so do strokes uh, is another example. So my group thinks that it's, um, it's a good research strategy instead to focus on biological aging itself, um, to try to slow biological aging to prevent the onset of age-related disease. Fortunately, uh, your body right now has a fantastic system that slows biological aging. Uh, this is the lysosomal system. The lysosome is the cell's recycling center or the cell's stomach. This is an organelle that can break down damaged and unwanted molecules and break those molecules into their constituent parts like amino acids, for example, and reuse those up for reuse in the cell cytosol, hence the term, the cell's recycling system. There are different ways you can get waste material to the lysosome for degradation, but we're gonna focus on autophagy today because that's been studied um, the best with regards to aging. Autophagy, the process of autophagy is shown in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Um, this is a process whereby cytosolic components like mitochondria that don't work properly anymore are sequestered by cups of membranes called phagophores. Now, these membranes are covered in a protein called LC32, and that becomes important for the rest of my talk. Um, that cup then grows into a vesicle called an autophagosome, and that traffics to the lysosome for degradation. Autophagy has lots of functions in the cell, but what's most important for this talk is that it's a form of quality control, and that quality control slows biological aging. It's, a, it's also important for nutritional support. If you want to know more about how autophagy slows biological aging, uh, please refer to this review article. I wrote it last year. I had lots of fun writing it, or ask me a few questions at the end of the talk. One of the best studied uh, so, uh, hallmarks of biological aging is loss of proteostasis. And it's loss of proteostasis that forms the clinical definition for Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease causes most dementia. Uh, for example, amyloid plaques, uh, which is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's, grow um, on the outside of neurons. You can think of these as little trash balls that grow in the brain. Um, inside of neurons, neurofibrillary tangles grow, and that's the other hallmark, pathological hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, amyloid plaques are formed of a little peptide called amyloid beta, which is cleaved out of a much larger protein called amyloid, amyloid precursor protein. And neurofibrillary tangles, that other hallmark of Alzheimer's, is formed of um, aggregates of tau protein that have become corrupted in a prion-like fashion. And indeed, this pathology spreads through the brain in a prion-like way that tracks quite closely with cognitive decline in a lot of people. I um, had a fantastic PhD student, Julian Carossi, who's now a fantastic postdoc, um, who wanted to investigate the role of the lysosomal system in suppressing hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. To do this, we collaborated with Associate Professor Cedric Barty, um, who works in the same space at Samri on Level 6 North, and also Professor Jürgen Gotts from the Queensland Brain Institute. 
Julian could take advantage of the prion-like nature of tau to grow aggregates of tau protein, GFP labeled in this picture, inside human cortical neurons that label with MAP2. And these little dots of GFP fluorescence are actually aggregates of tau that are growing inside human neurons. When Julian damaged the lysosomal system um, and stopped the process of autophagy by removing a protein called VPS35, he saw a huge increase in the number of tau aggregates inside of human cortical neurons. And this shows that the lysosomal system is working really hard all the time in these neurons to suppress one of the key hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And that's what's shown quantified in this graph here. Now, autophagy is really promising as a way to slow biological aging and to, to delay uh, age-related disease. And that's been shown by many other groups, not just our group. Um, however, there's been a real lack of translation. None of this work is, is being used for clinical benefit. And our group thinks that's because it's actually really hard to measure this process in people. It's hard to measure flux of material through autophagy through to the lysosome. Um, therefore, in about 2018, one of my postdocs, um, who, who's really good, uh, Dr. Julian Bensalem, decided to adapt a method for measuring autophagy from tissue culture to, to whole human blood. And this was our way of attempting to measure autophagy in people for the first time. Um, so to do that, I have to take you back to the beginning of the presentation. This is the process of autophagy, um, sequestration of material from the cytosol as trafficking to and degradation of the lysosome. Um, in tissue culture for many decades, people have been measuring this process um, by the addition of a lysosomal inhibitor, such as chloroquine, which stops degradation of autophagic cargo. You can then measure autophagic cargo by measuring that LC3B protein that I mentioned before. And the difference between uninhibited and inhibited conditions is roughly how much autophagic cargo should have been degraded in that time. Uh, Julian Benslam adapted this for use in whole human blood to give a faithful measure of autophagy in, in, a, in a real human sample for the first time. And this is what it looks like from, from an individual person. Uh, this is a Western blot for that autophagy protein, LC3, although we can also measure this with ELISA, which is more suitable for clinical studies. Here you can see increase, so I'll just get my cursor, increase in LC3B2, that autophagic cargo, over minutes post addition of the lysosomal inhibitor chloroquine. And you can see a nice increase in that autophagic cargo because you've stopped its degradation in the lysosome. Um, here's a nice graph showing that increase in that autophagy protein after inhibition of lysosomal function. Um, but you can see that there's really big error bars on that graph, and that's because if you break it down into individual people, you quickly figure out that people are very different. Um, here, for example, the purple line shows somebody who has very low autophagy, and the black line shows somebody who has comparatively very high autophagy. This begs a few questions. Uh, which person are you? Um, uh, what, what does disease do to autophagy? How does disease change autophagy? And can we change autophagy in people to alter their risk of age-related disease? Um, another thing we're now working on in the lab is we're trying to make this more clinically applicable because our vision is that one day doctors can use autophagy to predict uh, and alter your risk of age-related disease. So we're also trying to find biomarkers for autophagic flux in people. Um, that's an ongoing project that's been NHMRC funded. And so in summary, autophagy is really important for slowing biological aging and the hallmarks of dementia. Um, the goal of our group is to use this process to delay the onset of dementia. And I think actually more genuinely, um, what we're gonna do is delay the onset of age-related disease, um, uh, multiple age-related diseases, because um, autophagy um, actually relates to uh, pathology and numerous age-related diseases. Um, and I think the largest barrier to translation that we currently face is the lack of human data and measurement tools for autophagy in people. And that's what we're currently working on. Um, thank you for your attention. These are our wonderful collaborators and funders. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, maybe you could um, um, stop sharing and we can move to some questions. Um, if people have questions, could they please put them in the Q&A and uh, I can see them there and then um, give them to the presenters. So why, or in the chat, I don't really mind. Um, while people are thinking about a question or a, or a chat, um, maybe Tim, the, 
in the dementia space, there's been a lot of discussion about the amyloid hypothesis, and obviously mm. you use that as part of your research. I mean, does your hypothesis about the development of dementia require the amyloid hypothesis to be correct? Um, or could, you know, given that our lack of progress in terms of treatments worries some people about the amyloid hypothesis, um, do you need that to be correct or are they actually parallel hypotheses? Um, we don't need it to be correct. Um, although I think amyloid, the amyloid hypothesis and lysosomes are related. So amyloid material damages lysosomal function. And conversely, um, amyloid precursor protein, where the amyloid beta peptide comes from, is a really high turnover um, substrate for the lysosome. So I think um, that amyloid plaques, that they're a part of Alzheimer's disease. I actually think they exist because you've got decreased turnover of molecules. And I know amyloid precursor protein is, is a really sensitive cargo in the lysosome. So I think, um, you know, it, it could cause, and I do think it causes damage in the brain, amyloid plaques. I've seen that myself. Um, but I think it could also be an epiphenomenon, uh, prob probably both. <laughs> Having it both ways, Tim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I do. I, I do sincerely believe that because amyloid material in the brain does damage the brain. Um, you, you can see that clearly. You get swelling axons. You get an inflammatory response to uh, directly to the plaque. So I think it causes local damage. Um, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. If you look at the genetic signature for late onset Alzheimer's disease, you get a couple of groups of risk genes: um, lipid metabolism into lysosomal system and innate immunity. So I think all of these processes are, are involved um, in the decline of the brain. And I think that's why going after single, um, single hallmarks in Alzheimer's disease hasn't yielded any results. I think we're gonna to have to go after multiple domains. So, and um, as you probably are aware, there was a recent Lancet um, Commission on dementia, which highlighted a whole lot of Mm. things which were correlated with dementia and then a whole lot of lifestyle uh, adjustments that people could make in order to reduce their risk of dementia from your studies and the role of autophagy what would be the the major lifestyle interventions that anyone listening to your talk could implement into in their own um, life yeah so we we focus on things that really affect midlife and in midlife it's really about obesity and diabetes so those are those are risk factors um, in midlife for dementia um, later in life um, so I think exercise has also been shown exercise in midlife has also been shown to reduce the progression of Alzheimer's biomarkers so um, and, and smoking as well but that's a bit of a no-brainer so um, looking after cardiovascular health exercise uh, reducing diabetes and obesity, I think, are uh, major things you can do for yourself, yeah. Right. I have heard you in the past, Tim, talk about protein and the yeah. protein. Have you given up on that? No, no, that's ongoing. So um, that's a part of my extended talk, um, but I didn't have time to get into it today. Um, so there's a big, and this is picking up momentum now, there's a big literature um, on dietary protein, which is, it, it, it's, fairly split down the middle in terms of its popularity. People either love it, love it or hate it. Um, so in people, high protein diets, just to begin with as a starting point, point high protein diets can be used to lose weight. And if you're obese, losing weight is your priority. Um, however, people have now noticed in um, lab laboratory models that high protein diets can drive biological aging. And that in part um, could work through mTOR suppressing um, autophagy, the processes that I've talked about today. Um, we're looking at that currently. We've got some prelim data, um, which is showing some promise in mice, um, but we've been funded to look at that both in larger mouse studies and also in human studies now. So later this year, we're going to kick off a human study where we adjust dietary protein and look at its impact on autophagy in, in blood from people. So I still think that's promising, but it's embryonic um, and it's so contentious, people get so worked up about it um, that, yeah. I don't think anyone want to give, want, wants to give away their ribeye just yet, do they? No, I, I love steak too. I, I will, I'll, I'll die eating steak, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe a little less. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Tim. That was a terrific talk and a, a, a key. Um, actually, we have one. We have a question. Could you overcome high protein diet with fasting to activate 
or autophagy? Yeah, that's really interesting. So um, I, I've, I've never actually heard of that one before, but that's like having your cake and eating it too, I suppose. Um, fasting is, is really interesting. So in mouse models, if you fast a mouse for one or two days, you do activate autophagy. However, um, a mouse can only survive three days without food. I think that's really important to note. So a mouse starves to death within about three days. For a human, um, you do get metabolic benefits from fasting, that's true. But for a human to starve to death, you have to starve a human for um, three weeks to, to a month or more. So a human can go a long time without food. So whether or not a day or two is enough for a human to activate autophagy, um, we're actually looking into that now with Professor Leonie Helbron, but um, we're just not sure about the answer quite yet. All right, fascinating, really good. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Um, Time to move on to Stuart. We have to give Stuart his adequate time. So um, well, we talk about protein and autophagy all day. So um, Stuart's going to talk about chronic visceral pain, big problems, big opportunities. Thank you very much, Stuart. No worries. Can you see my uh, screen okay? Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks for the, uh, the introduction, Tim. And uh, to Steve. Um, so yeah, this is my uh, my visceral pain research group. Uh, we're based here at uh, at Samri. Uh, particularly, want to thank all the members of the group, our funding through NHMRC, ARC, NIH, and also our industry collaborators, uh, and also uh, our key collaborators that we're working with uh, throughout um, Australia. Also, Cedric and Gregory at Samri, and also other people overseas. So. What's so great about pain, you might ask? Well, you know, it's, first of all, it's important to realize that not all forms of pain are the same. So there's that immediate nociceptive pain, which is an alarm system that lets us know when something's wrong. Um, there's also the inflammatory or injury evoked pain that's secondary to the nociceptive pain. That's a protective mechanism which allows tissue healing without doing any further damage. And that's where you get a sensitized or heightened response such as hyperalgesia and allodynia. So heightened pain and pain when you shouldn't get pain. And then there's the persistent or chronic pain, and that occurs in the absence of an overt stimuli or tissue damage. It's really a maladaptive, essentially ongoing false alarm. It's a relapsing and remitting condition that can last for decades. And really it's a failure of the nociceptive pathways to reset back to normal. And it's more intense and debilitating than during the inflammatory or injury evoked pain and what's really troubling for the patient and also for clinicians is that there can be no obvious cause of the pain at the time of consultation. So chronic pain is really one of the most underestimated healthcare problems in the world today. It affects over 1.5 billion people globally. It's affecting over three and a half million Australians. And when you talk about pain, it's a bit like saying someone's got cancer. It's, it's sort of a, a banner, but it encapsulates many different conditions in many different forms, which can be back pain, migraine, arthritis, radiotherapy or chemotherapy induced pain, or what I'm particularly interested in is abdominal pain and pelvic pain. And these patients have a very poor quality of life. They've got anxiety, depression, and also a higher suicide risk. The economic burden is huge globally, but also particularly here in Australia. And to put this into context, chronic pain affects more people and costs more than heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And you might think, well, isn't treating chronic pain really easy? You just give people painkillers. And of course that's led to the opioid uh, epidemic and the treatment which is supposed to be helping people is actually killing people. And there are more people dying from overdose from opioids in America than there are from AIDS or gun violence or uh, car crashes. And this is all trying to treat their, their chronic pain. So I'm particularly interested in chronic abdominal and pelvic pain that includes conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome, which affects 11% of the global population, inflammatory bowel disease, which affects 1% of the Western population, bladder pain syndrome, which affects 5% of the Western population, and endometriosis, which affects 10% of females. Now, even if you talk about something like uh, abdominal pain from the gut, there are multiple different causes of that. You can have this nociceptive pain that you get due to appendicitis or gastroenteritis. There are these structural diseases such as celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease, 
where you have a really clear underlying pathology, a clear disruption of the gut epithelium and the mucosal inflammation. Or are there, these are the, uh, there are also these so-called functional diseases like functional dyspepsia and irritable bowel syndrome where there's, there's this lack of overt mucosal damage and inflammation at the time of presentation. And for these patients, there's various contributing susceptibilities, diet, altered microbiome, adverse life events, symptoms can often be worsened or triggered by stress. Uh, women are far more likely to have uh, gut pain than men are. There are some also some genetic predispositions, but gut infection is really one of the key uh, triggers and drivers of this particular type of pain. And again, these conditions are all linked with fibromyalgia, depression, anxiety relative to the general population. So why are we doing this? Well, to put this all into context, um, a recent IBS global impact report said, you know, what are individuals prepared to give up in order to live symptom free? Well, these conditions are so insidious that patients reported they'd give up 25% of the remaining life to live symptom free. 14% said they'd risk a one in a thousand chance of death to live symptom free. 46% agreed with a statement, I'm willing to try anything to help manage my IBS. And unfortunately, 11% even said, when my IBS is bad, I wish I was dead. So I think that really sort of puts it into perspective as to what we're dealing with here. And there was an Australian person living with IBS who said, imagine a day where you feel Ill, Ill from having eaten too much, and then imagine that day lasts months at a time. So the problem we have is, is that there's a complete lack of treatments for abdominal and pelvic pain. Opioids obviously have serious side effects. They've got addiction and dependence. They're also not suitable for visceral pain because they cause constipation. So therefore we need new visceral pain therapies that are highly specific for the conditions. They need to target the underlying cause of the pain, the sensory afferents in the pain pathway. And we need to design drugs to be restricted to the periphery or the gut wall which also minimizes the systemic side effects. So essentially that's what we're doing. So people are probably more familiar with the pain mechanisms uh, in terms of how we perceive pain from the skin. We have sensory neurons, which are located in dorsoroot ganglia. They have projections into the skin in this case. They have a variety of different functions. They have uh, either physiological functions or they're nociceptors that signal pain. They then connect up into the spinal cord and these signals then go into various different areas of the, the pain processing regions. Well, the gastrointestinal tract and visceral organs in general uh, are similar. They have nerve innervation, even though we don't notice it most of the time. And particularly the interest of the organs we're interested in, the colon, the bladder and the reproductive organs, they're all innervated by spinal afferents within particular pathways. Uh, and these pathways overlap in terms of their, their region and also their, their profiling into the spinal cord and also into the brain. And that's why there's a large clinical comorbidity of these patients. Patients with IBS can have bladder pain syndrome. Patients with endometriosis can have IBS, for instance. So how does this pain actually happen? Well, we know, for instance, that even in the gut, the metabolites produced by the microbiome can act on specialized cells within the uh, epithelium, which release mediators onto these sensory afferents. And then these sensory afferents um, express a wide variety of both pro and anti nociceptive or excitatory and inhibitory channels, which respond to a wide variety of different mediators, including those from bacterial cells in response to tissue damage. And there's also a wide variety of changes and in terms of immune cells and the mediators that they release. So it's this incredible complex uh, milieu in which these uh, afferents are, are sensing. And from the work we and others have done, we know there's a series of different cascade of events that contributes to IBS pain. There's definitely an altered microbiota composition, there's decreased barrier function, there's increased or altered immune responses. There's also increased mucosal permeability, so the barrier between the lumen and these afferents is decreased. This results in increased release of mediators from cells in the colon, for instance. It alters gastrointestinal motility. These endings within the gut wall 
uh, become hypersensitive and the channels and receptors within them change. The cell bodies of these afferents therefore become hyperexcitable. The central terminals of these afferents sprout within the spinal cord, so they start rewiring the, the normal uh, mechanisms. There's also increased astrocyte and microglial uh, expression, both within the dorsal root ganglia and the spinal cord. You get increased number of neurons activated per any given stimuli. And this also results in central uh, sensitization and processing, um, which ultimately leads to pain and response to gut stimuli. So how do you look at that? Well, in terms of trying to work out the mechanisms, you obviously need techniques to study every single part of the pathway. And I won't go into this in uh, particular detail, but we've got a variety of different te of techniques where we can look at the peripheral endings in terms of their function and expression. We can also look at a variety of different whole animal studies, uh, also mechanisms within the spinal cord and the brain. And we relate the animal models back to what we're seeing uh, in humans by using sensory DRG neurons, clonic biopsies and biospecimens from patients. So we've sort of got a, uh, a translation, reverse translation mechanism going on here. We've also got some new techniques that we're utilizing at the moment uh, across the ABMC. This includes intravital imaging, where we can look at how neurons respond in, in real time in terms of uh, the responses to various stimuli. Uh, in collaboration with um, the SAGC and Cedric Barty, we've been looking at um, single cell RNA-seq with 10X to look at how there's altered transcriptomic profile in neurons in these chronic pain states. We're also looking uh, at how the innovation of the colon and the bladder can overlap within the spinal cord. And this is some really great tracing that Andrea Harrington's done, and it helps explain why you get these, um, these comorbidities. We're also looking at molecular expression profile in human biopsies uh, from patients and also from DRG neurons. And this is a particular example where we're looking at some of the irritant mechanisms which activate uh, these afferents. So with all that said, it's pretty clear that there's a variety of different uh, factors which contribute to chronic visceral pain. We also need to consider whether there's active inflammation or whether it's in remission, what's the severity of the disease, what's the time since diagnosis, what's the degree of chronicity, um, and what's the, the primary target for treatment? Is it barrier dysfunction, immune dysfunction, neuroplasticity, dysbiosis, pain, or, or all of the above? So with so many challenges, what are the opportunities? And I think with every problem, it's always an opportunity in disguise. So we've been lucky enough to work uh, with a company that's uh, been out of um, get an FDA uh, drug approved for irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. This drug is localized to the gastrointestinal tract it acts on a receptor within the gastrointestinal tract, and it actually provides uh, pain relief in these patients uh, in a phase three clinical trial. Uh, and this is now the, the number one selling IBSC pain treatment in the world. So the take home message is that chronic abdominal and pelvic or visceral pain affects greater than 20% of the population. There are clear mechanisms which underlie this debilitating pain. This contribution both of peripheral but also central mechanisms and we need novel techniques to investigate the mechanisms and the causality at these various levels but i think also what we've shown is that it's possible to treat chronic abdominal pain at its source and stop it in the periphery uh, and finally we're always happy to collaborate and if uh, anyone's interested uh, you know we're always interested in clinical biospecimens as well otherwise thanks for your time and happy to take any questions Thanks very much, Stuart, and um, perhaps stop sharing your screen um, so we can see you clearly. Uh, excellent. And again, uh, anyone who has any um, questions, can they put them in the Q&A or in the chat? Um, maybe again, I'll, I'll start just, just listening to that. Um, it occurred to me that the DRGs that, um, that are associated with the gut are mainly there to measure pain. So, you know, would it be possible just to knock out, you know, use some sort of toxin or so, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking in the big picture now, you know, just yeah. knock out the DRGs. Why do you need to feel your gut? 
Well, it's it lets us know when obviously we've got an issue. So a bit like we we sense pain normally. So there's conditional um, knockouts in humans for for NAV one point seven, for instance. Those people who can't feel pain, they actually don't live very long, because you know they'll, they'll jump off of roofs and uh, you know they're, they're actually sort of a, a sideshow in, uh, in 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 places in India. Um, but I'm just talking about the DRGs that innovate your gut, not the yeah, DRGs exactly. That so. Skin. They're not all nociceptors. They some of them within the DRG actually do provide feedback to change uh, secretion and motility reflexes. So they're not only just um, nociceptors. They also do manage blood flow. They also do uh, have a crucial role in terms of immune response as well. Um, so yeah, I think what it really boils down to is that instead of removing all the DRG. What we need to do is target those specific neurons, which are the pain sensors, and reduce their function and, and block the, the signals which are being transmitted um, up to the spinal cord and brain. All right, still waiting for a question, but a, another one, an obvious question from me, which you would have expected, Stuart, was, you know, it seems to me that, you know, I think you had seven or eight pathways, but the primary pathway was always bacteria or the gut. So why wouldn't we just change the microbiome? Well, that's right. That's where everything's coming to at the moment. And I think, you know, with the studies which have been there for things like IBD and IBS, it's always been causality. Is it chicken or, or egg? Is it the microbiome driving this or is it, you know, a byproduct of this? And I think there's more and more uh, evidence now suggesting that these changes are caused by, you know, dysbiosis. And of course, the question now is, is that, is it just bacteria? Is it the virome? Is it the phagome, et cetera, which all contributes to this? And, you know, it's, it's a cascade. You know, once you get barrier dysfunction, then you start getting immune dysregulation, you got neuronal activation, et cetera. And of course, the big question is, you know, what is the actual adequate, appropriate, normal composition? We actually have a question from your co-panelist here. So, um... Tim is asking, are there any genetic risk factors that identify microglial inflammation and chronic pain? That's a good point. So there's actually um, gender differences from that point of view. So there's, there's actually differences in chronic pain mechanisms between males and females in terms of whether there's microglial uh, recruitment or not. Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest um, you know, differences there. But has anyone done a sort of really broad genetic um, screen, perhaps in the UK Biobank or something? Yeah, there's been some various GWAS studies which have been um, published recently about some of the, the risk factors. Uh, there's a variety of different, um, you know, neuronal and, um, and microglial mechanisms there, um, but the specific ones um, escape me at the moment. All right. I think um, we might stop there. And I think you can see in the two speakers that there's a, a whole lot of really interesting translational research going on there with some really neat ideas about dealing with, you know, really big problems, um, obviously dementia and, uh, and chronic pain. So um, I think we should be very proud of what we've got in the building and thank Tim and Stuart for their talk. Thank you very much.